it's, I guess it's kind of like a fine. So anything above the amount of pollution that they actually just pay into that. So is this wetland bank, um, would that be similar uh, that we're kind of paying that we've, you know, destroyed some part of the wetland. So instead of restoring a wetland, we're actually going to pay to help someone else preserve wetland somewhere in, in another area? Yes. Okay. It, the, the only difference for the wetland, it has to be within the same watershed. Okay. So we couldn't buy something in Michigan or it, it has to be within the same watershed. And so by um, paying for that wetland, that takes it, essentially takes it off the market from anyone else purchasing. And I'm wondering why these wetlands wouldn't already be protected or, or is there just not? Those, uh, you know, I'm not familiar with the, the, the okay. wetland bank and how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, all I know is there is a list of all these different areas that gotcha. are available. Okay. And, and we purchase on that. That makes sense. I'm glad to hear that I wasn't aware. Um, that's all the questions I have. Mr. Benjamin. Mr. Chairman, just to add an example. Mm -hmm. So you, you would uh, get a clearer picture of this. Uh, in Parma, south of the Chevy plant, there was a, uh, and this is north of Snow Road, there was a considerable amount of, uh, of land, and, and Parma wanted to put in an industrial park. Well, a certain amount of this land was deemed to be wetlands. So to develop it, we had to find, and the developer had to find, uh, other possible areas uh, that would <clears throat> be able to be a wetland and have, you know, an, a conservation easement so that it wouldn't be uh, used. So, if if you take that situation over to this property, if ever anybody ever wanted to develop this wetland in that wetland, they would have to then contribute to other wetlands. So this is a way of, of keeping, uh, so we don't have the reduction of wetlands. It's, it's kind of like a, the bank is kind of a balancing plan. I think, does that help clear it up? Thanks. Any further discussion? I'll make a motion to refer this to the council as a whole under second reading suspension. Second. Discussion? Councilman, I, I believe this was also referred to the sustainability committee. Is that too? right? Okay. Um, no, yeah, you can no. pass it out. We're meeting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, Councilman Germano is on that committee. I, I don't think we would. Uh, do you have enough for quorum? Could we back this into a joint committee meeting? Or, or do you have to post it? Have to post it. Yeah, not going to slip through. Okay. Well, I think, I think uh, yeah. Councilwoman Simon would like to hear about this as well. Yeah. and Because um, this is an important concept. This, this whole wetland, uh, any developer, <laughs> wetlands, they're, they're very, very conscious of because uh, uh, we're protecting, uh, and it's a great thing that we're protecting wetlands, and uh, that's that's one of the, the first things when you're looking at an area, you want to see if there's wetlands there because you know you're going to have to pass on, pass up, and support future or bigger wetlands. And and normally, I I don't know what the exact formula is, but normally, for every wetland that you disturb. <laughs> you, it's a multiple, so it's not even equal. Yeah. You you got to got to save more wetland, which is a good thing. Yeah, actually, on Fitch grade separation, the rate was two point one to one. So the Army Corps determine what rate you have to replace the wetlands. Well, uh, we will refer this to committee, um, and or. 
What's the best procedure? Give well, me some it, help it, here. What uh, should we it, do? If I may, and I, I don't, I, 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 on Go behalf ahead. of the administration, I don't know that I can comment on that. I, mm -hmm. I do think, though, that my recollection is consistent with what Councilman Rogers said, that there, there was a desire or, or a need for this to go through the sustainability as well. Um, and I think we're at the point, uh, Director T. Wynn, if, if, where, I mean, we're getting close to the end, correct? Because I, I did have an opportunity to discuss this with the executive, and he's similar to what Councilman Germana's comments are. I mean, it's, it's a very exciting prospect to be in this position, to actually be adding uh, wetlands as opposed to, to, to siphoning them off of our, of our plats. But nonetheless, I do think it has to go through sustainability. My guess is then come back and then go before the Committee of the Whole. Is that is that accurate? I think it is. Mr. Chairman, uh, Councilman Miller. Mr. Chairman, uh, we can uh, recommend the legislation for approval and without saying that we refer it. And then, uh, and then when it goes to sustainability committee, then the sustainability committee can recommend it for approval and then, then refer, and refer it to the full council for their action. So, uh, so with that, I make a motion that, uh, that, that this committee, uh, favorably report resolution 2011-0319 and uh, recommend its approval by the full council. Second. Okay, moved by Miller, seconded by Councilman Germana. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Resolution is recommended for approval. Chair, I would just uh, like to ask uh, Councilman Miller, so anytime there's a, a dual committee hearing the same legislation, you use the term, if you're not the primary, I guess the primary uh, sponsor of that legislation, the committee that's primary sponsor, and you use the terms favorably report. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's a good way to express it because uh, because we're not ready to refer it yet because it has to be heard by another committee. Now, I think often we have, have joint committees where they both meet at the same time. And even though one committee may be designated as, as the primary committee, if, if they're both meeting at the same time and, and taking action essentially simultaneously, then I think both committees could make a motion to refer it to the full, full council. Thank you. The item, for, the item still remains here until the, but we are sending it to council as a whole. It, it goes from here to the uh, sustainability committee because it's been referred to both committees and, and since we've acted upon it, then it, now the uh, sustainability committee can take it and act on it. Okay. Yes. So um, I guess if you guys can be here, to that meeting tomorrow at 1. I'm not sure if Kalila, you've already made arrangements. I have sent out the agenda, uh, but I'm not confirmed any attendance. Okay. Well, um, our meeting's at 1, and for the um, for Councilwoman Simon, we want to make sure that she's has the opportunity to hear the full presentation. I'll be here, but I can't help. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. If there's no further discussion, we will move on. Uh, any miscellaneous business? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we had a motion, and did we have a second? Seconded by Germana. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. This is, item is referred to the Environment and Sustainability Committee. Any miscellaneous business? Has anyone signed in for public comment? No, sir. No one signed in. All right. We have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Councilman. Second. Seconded by Councilman Germano. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. This meeting is adjourned.
This meeting of the Committee of the Hall for the purpose of the uh, proposed 2012 to 2013 biennial budget for Cuyahoga County is called to order and the clerk will please call the roll. Calling the roll, Mr. Jones? Here. Mr. Rogers? Here. Ms. Simon? Here. Mr. Greenspan? Here. Mr. Miller? Present. Mr. Brady? Present. Mr. Germana? Here. Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Strawn? That is yours. Ms. Conwell? Here. Ms. Conley? There is a quorum. Council President Conley and, uh, and Councilman Schwann have indicated they're, uh, they're in the middle of other meetings, but we'll, we expect them to join us sometime during this meeting. Uh, I know that we have a number of people who have signed up for public comment, and I'm going to uh, get the public comment forms. Okay, uh, everybody, uh, everybody presenting will have, uh, have three minutes to, uh, to present before the council. And uh, because of the number of presenters, uh, we're, uh, we're going to stick with the three minute time, but we're going to ask everybody to uh, to strictly observe it and to uh, please keep your eye on the monitor over there in the corner and, uh, and conclude your remarks within the, within the three minutes. The first person to present is Judge Nancy First. It is an honor to, uh, to have you back before the, uh, the uh, Council, you you swore us in when we started, and you've been here before, and again you're back. So. And I think I'm spending the afternoon with you today, so please, I'll, please you'll proceed. see me a couple times today. Um, Honorable Chairman and uh, members of Council, uh, thank you very much. I it's a, it's unusual for a judge to come and speak. Uh, on behalf of someone like the Adams Board, but I have done this with Bill Danahan in Columbus, and I thought it was important uh, to come because what what he does uh, in with the Adams Board uh, does impact the court, and I want you to just uh, hear our side or the uh, facet that we deal with. Um, you know that the court is a delivery mechanism uh, now of many social services. We have five mental health court judges and over 500 individuals who are part presently on the mental health dockets. And there are also others involved in the court system who have mental health and behavioral health needs who are not eligible. They don't rise to that level, but do need those services. Uh, they begin at the entry level. Assessments by professionals for, uh, and dual diagnosis uh, is a frequent situation. Acute episodes of mental health uh, problems. Timely treatment is extremely necessary. Um, that uh, so in order to stabilize uh, someone so that they don't decompensate more, um, lengthy decompensation, uh, there is less chance for recovery. Uh, it also becomes very difficult for those who are, uh, for the jailers, uh, our sheriff feels this, um, this problem as well. We have to make sure that they are legally uh, competent to proceed. Uh, their time in jail is expensive, as I mentioned, uh, at least $200 a day. Chronic problems, we want to make sure at the entry level that they're linked to their med back to their meds and services and treatment. Uh, the, in, as the case moves through our court system, the mental health, behavioral health needs uh, go into a case planning phase, uh, linkage to vital services, supervision to ensure compliance with medication and treatment, uh, housing and life skills. These individuals are really troubled in every facet, not just their um, mental health and behavioral health problems. The goal is ultimately to reduce recidivism and to act as a safety net because we, that's uh, what our job is. Uh, not only for the 
community at large, uh, the safety of the community is at risk when these individuals are not properly treated when they're with the court system, but also individual safety because we know that the death rate is increased for this population as well. Uh, we in the court draw on the services from the Adams Board to accomplish our ends and uh, we enjoy a very nice relationship. I hope that you will consider these uh, implications when you uh, consider his funding. I don't know if you have any questions. In particular, I'm sure Bill will be able to answer in more detail. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you very much for your testimony. Before we continue, since everybody will be presenting about the budget resolution, I'd like to go ahead and ask the uh, clerk to read the resolution and get it on our agenda. Resolution number 2011-0291, a resolution adopting the 2012-2013 biennial operating budget and capital improvements program and declaring the necessity that this resolution become immediately effective. Thank you very much. The uh, budget resolution is before the, the uh, Committee of the Whole and the next presenter is Ms. Emily Campbell from the Center for Community Solutions. Thank you very much. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, there are several people who have submitted written testimony which will be uh, put with the record uh, once the meeting is over. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Miller and uh, members of the Cuyahoga County Council. I am Emily Campbell, a public policy fellow for the Center for Community Solutions. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. First of all, uh, Community Solutions would like to commend you for making the county budget process more open and accessible, which strengthens the ability of county residents to express their views about the priorities that are in this budget. The opportunities for public comment at every meeting, the posting of the agenda before each meeting, and making presentations available via your website following the meetings are vital to open government. Finally, the live streaming that you've implemented mean that those who may not be able to attend the meeting in person are able to have the benefit of hearing the presentations and discussion, so thank you for that. As you know, Community Solutions has been involved with the county transition process. Our executive director, John Bagala, chaired the Health and Human Services work group during that process last year, and we've corresponded with each of you over the course of the past year, and we'll continue to advocate for the implementation of those recommendations that were developed during that process. Today, I'd like to call your t attention specifically to one of those recommendations. It's known as number five in our work group report and states county council and executive should fully support health and human service levies and ensure adequate core support services. As you know, the budget that you are considering is balanced using more than $225 million from the health and human services levy fund. And it's balanced on the assumption that next year's campaign to renew the larger of the two health and human service levies will be successful. The loss of any of that revenue would be devastating to programs and to the residents of Cuyahoga County. As the transition recommendation points out, full support of a levy campaign includes taking a lead role in fundraising to cover campaign costs, speaking persuasively about the importance of the levy, and encouraging human service providers to take an active role in the campaign. I hope that the health and social service community of Cuyahoga County can count on your support in this important matter. The staff of the Center for Community Solutions is always available to provide issue analysis and decision support as you grapple with the difficult issues facing our community. To that end, in the coming weeks, we will re release a report on human service spending in Cuyahoga County and the implications of state and federal policy changes going forward. We will certainly share copies of that report with all of you, and I hope that you find the information useful. So thank you very much for your time today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. And, uh, Madam Clerk, I would request if you could uh, prepare copies of any written testimony of anyone that did not present in person and, and distribute it to all of the council because people should have the opportunity to read that testimony and consider it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have Terry Russell, NAMI, Ohio. Welcome to the committee. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the council uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I am Terry Russell and I'm the executive director of the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Ohio, NAMI, Ohio, headquartered in Columbus. 
I speak on behalf of 536,000 citizens whose lives have been invaded by mental illness. The highest concentration of the families and consumers of these illnesses is here in Cuyahoga County. We must be all ashamed as a society of how we have allowed these individuals to wander the countryside. Mental illness is no different than the illnesses of other organs of the body, but the symptoms that this illness creates alienates these individuals from mainstream society. With treatment, our outcomes are greater than those suffering from heart illnesses, from cancer, and other major organ uh, problems. You are very fortunate to have Chief Denahan <coughs> as the leader of the mental health system. But over the past 10 years, their budget has been devastated. They need you to approve the additional request of $25 million. Without these funds, this community will spend much more than this in other county departments, including the criminal justice system and the health care system. Families will be destroyed, and each of these individuals will suffer more than one can imagine. As I enter my 40th year of working in the mental health field, I never thought that we would still be failing these individuals who, at no fault of their own, suffer from mental illness. In 1959, I got off the school bus and I was 13 years old, and they were taking my brother out in a paddy wagon to the state hospital. The kids on the bus were terrible because of the image. I walked in, my mother was in the back bedroom, and she said, what are the people at the church going to think? What are the people, neighbors going to think? My father wasn't there, he's out working seven days a week, made a lot of money, but he wasn't working to make money. It was to escape the mental illness that had our families, that house, and the mental illness of my brother. My brother's gone now, and he will be remembered because of his illness, and he was a tremendous person, but he had a mental illness. Let's not let other families go what through my family went. In 1959, we should be doing better today, and here in Cuyahoga County, you have the opportunity, but we can't do it without the resources needed to do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, next we have Norbert S. Rall, Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging. Mr. Rall, welcome to the committee and you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, Benjamin Rose was uh, founded in 1908. We provide services, research, and advocacy to seniors in Cuyahoga County. Uh, we have a contract with the Mental Health Board. Uh, we provide mental health assessment, mental health counseling, mental health case management, and partial hospitalization. Uh, our organization is unique in that we uh, provide all services in the home. Very few services are provided in an office. Uh, we only serve people 55 and above. Um, the average age of our typical client is 70. The mission of the agency is to advance the health, independence, and dignity of older adults. It is a small but essential program. We serve about 400 clients a year. Uh, as a result of budget reductions this past year to our non-Medicaid funding, uh, the program had to reduce staff by one position, resulting in reduction of services to about 50 people this year. Uh, a fundamental problem is that two-thirds of the seniors we serve have incomes in the near poverty category that makes them ineligible for Medicaid and most entitlements. It often leaves them with marginal resources and one step away from homelessness or economic disaster. A struggle with mental illness will often tax their resources to the breaking point. Uh, these clients are generally limited in mobility and have multiple medical problems. Um, it is not uncommon for us to see people in their 60s, 70s, and occasionally in their 80s who wind up homeless or on the brink of homelessness. Uh, the ironic thing is, is that many of these people have been functional most of their lives, have worked, and are the ones who would benefit the most from treatment. Um, we currently have a waiting list because we just don't have enough staff uh, to provide services to the people. Uh, thank you for your time and your willingness, willingness to listen to us. Thank you very much. Next we have Esther, I think it's Pla, is that correct? Connections Wellness Advocacy. Welcome to the committee. 
Honorable Chairman and Council Members, good afternoon. My name is Esther Pla. I am a nurse and I am a C the CEO of Connections Health, Wellness and Advocacy, which is a community ba behavioral health center headquartered in Beechwood. I am also the Vice President of the Council of Agency Directors. I am here to speak in support of the Adams Board uh, request for additional money and to share with you the impact the funding cuts have had on the consumers we serve. <clears throat> Connections has been the central intake agency for the non-insured citizens with, behavior, with mental health needs in our county since January 2011. We have completed 325 community assessments January 1st through June 30th of 2011. The number completed from July 1st through October 31st has been 231. These numbers are significantly higher than the six months prior. From the hospital, we have completed 165 assessments from January 1st through June 30th. These are folks coming out of the state hospital. The number from July 1st through October 31st has only been 59. The numbers are less, and the reason for that is because the work going on in screening in the hospital is better, and there was a redu reduction in census when the hospital from Cleveland went to Northfield. The funding cuts have placed the mental health system in Cuyahoga County in a crisis. As of last week, we had to stop scheduling new intakes due to an ever-growing waiting list of people needing to be received by the assigned agencies. Current wait list is, a, is, 85, is at 85, and we are now calling the 79 clients that are waiting for intakes to, be, to come into the system. We are checking their clinical status and informing them of the system capacity issues. The mental health system in Cuyahoga County is now closed. For connections, what does that mean? From January 3rd from six, and through June 30th, we accepted 93 uninsured clients. From July, 7, from July 1st through October 31st, we accepted 107. That's double the amount from last year. If we continue to do this, Connections will overuse our allocation by $400,000. For the county, what does that mean? For the, all the providers, increased bed days, increased homelessness, increased use of the emergency room, people not served, children whose parents lost, health care, and increase suicide rates. And if you had to pick up the call and listen to the family members who are calling saying, why are you doing this to my child? An email I got yesterday was devastating. I don't have a family member like Terry, but I've been a nurse for 40 years in the system, and this is devastating. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And next we have Grover Gilmore, Magnolia Clubhouse, and Mandel School at Case Western Reserve University. Welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you. It's an honor being to appear before the board. I am the Dean of the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences at Case Western Reserve, but today I appear as the President of the Board of Magnolia Clubhouse, where I've been volunteering for a long period of time. Magnolia Clubhouse is a psychosocial rehabilitation center which has its roots back to 1961 in, in uh, Cleveland. The model is effective, most importantly it's cost effective. It's recognized by the federal agency SAMHSA as an evidence-based model. We work today with over 322 members. That's a reduction in the number of people that we have since our cuts in funding. We have over 400 people who are on the waiting list to come into our, our clubhouse. It's a model where people work together to support one another. They learn to communicate. They learn to work. They learn to become effective members of our society once again. I was drawn into the center when I met a man in his 40s who told me that he had never held a job in his life because he was struck by mental illness when he was a teenager. And yet, at that time, he was working full-time for the Federal Reserve as a clerk because, and he talked about the process he'd gone through as a clubhouse member in learning how to communicate, learning how to carry out effectively in the workplace, and how he'd earned his place now in the workplace. And he was very proud of that and very proud to be a productive citizen, a taxpayer. Within the clubhouse model, 
four, we have four times a higher rate of employment for people with, with mental illness. It's a lot cheaper to take care of people in the community than to hospitalize them. And so today, we ask for your support in restoring money to the Adams Board so that we can carry out, as all the agencies you're hearing from, this effective service in our, in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next, we have Dr. Robert L. Smith Stalamaris. Welcome to the committee. Dr. Smith, you may proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Robert Smith. I'm the interim executive director for Stella Maris, an alcohol, drug, and mental health facility <clears throat> that serves the homeless and the indigent located here in Cleveland. The intent of my testimony today is to support the request of the Adamus Board of Cuyahoga County for an additional $25 million to support behavioral health care services. <clears throat> I have taken the liberty to modify a literary piece written by Charles Dickens. Perhaps you'll recognize it. At this festive season of the year, it is more than usually desirable that we make some provision for the poor and the destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. Are the jails and workhouses still in operation? They are. Still, I wish that they were not. The welfare and food stamp programs, are they in full vigor? Both are very busy. Oh, I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them from their useful course. Well, no, but a few of us are endeavoring to raise funds, funds for the poor, to provide needed services, substance abuse treatment, psychiatric medications, health counseling, and permanent housing. We choose this time. It is a time of all others where want is keenly felt. What shall we put you down for? This modified quotation from Dickens, A Christmas Carol, reflects a discussion that is relevant to us today. Without adequate funds, individuals with alcoholism, drug addiction, and mental illness go untreated. Untreated, these illnesses lead to issues and financial burdens that we as a community cannot afford. For these untreated individuals are often unemployed, uninsured, and homeless. They have medical complications that result in emergency room visits and hospitalizations. They rely on welfare and food stamps, and they often resort to criminal activities to support their addictions. I believe that acting like Scrooge, turning our backs on these individuals, is not an acceptable option for us. Let me share briefly what adequate funding and treatment can accomplish. Last fiscal year, Stella Maris treated over 700 men and women. Of those who completed treatment, 98% had no legal involvement. 75% remained abstinent from alcohol and drugs. 70% had sta safe, stable housing at discharge. And 52% had employment or were enrolled in vocational programs. Thus, with treatment, these men and women are able to achieve mental health, sobriety, and stability, returning to our community as contributing citizens. So I ask again, what shall I put you down for? My hope is that it will be for $25 million, additional funds needed to address the behavioral health care needs of Cuyahoga County. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And next we have Buddy Bailey, AOD Directors and Free Medical Clinic. Welcome to the committee. Thank Please you. proceed. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here today because I'd like to tell you the story of a little boy. Harry was six years old when the police came and removed him from his home. His father was addicted to gambling, had issues with psychosis, and was physically abusive to Harry's mother, who was developmentally disabled. Harry recalled the last memory he had of his mother as she was riding away on her bicycle. He says he ran after her, but she never looked back. She was to be homeless. After being removed from his home, 
he and his two brothers experienced multiple placements until at the age of seven, it was apparent that the foster families could not handle him. He spent from age seven through age nine in various treatment settings until finally being placed at Beachbrook here in Cleveland. When he was 10, Harry was placed with a foster mom in Cleveland Heights and was on his 11th birthday, I'm proud to say that my partner and I adopted him. This is Harry at 11 years old. This is my beautiful son. From the age of 11 to age 15, Harry made great progress. From being afraid that people would steal him to being able to explore the neighborhood and make friends. He did much better in school. He and I talked every night about his fears and sometimes about sneaky pee. Maybe you don't know what that is, but for boys who wet the bed, sneaky pee is pretty important. You gotta make sure you don't let sneaky pee out. You know what he'll do. You know how he is. Every night we talked. He learned he liked math and was good at it. He said that he wanted to be a lawyer because I'm good at arguing. He was very good at arguing, is very good at arguing. He attended the positive education program for three years until he was placed at the Center for Autism at the Cleveland Clinic after being diagnosed with Asperger's disorder. Harry was also diagnosed with bipolar disorder and has significant attachment issues, even today he will only allow my partner and I to hug him. Shortly after Harry's 16th birthday, he began to significantly decompensate. Harry was asked to leave the Center for Autism because they can no longer control him. He was becoming a danger to himself and to others. One year later, he had been in nine different placements and was ultimately placed at Parmadale three months ago no longer capable of being cared for by my partner and me. Harry will be 18 years old in March of next year and will continue to receive the services from the Board of DD. This is my son today. When you go home tonight and you look at your children, wonder what it might be like if what happened to my son and my family should happen to your son or daughter or your family. It happened to mine. I'm Dr. Buddy Bailey. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm the chair of the Alcohol and Drug Treatment Providers Association of Greater Cleveland. I'm the director of behavioral health at the Free Medical Clinic of Greater Cleveland. But more importantly, I'm Harry's dad. Thank you for your support, and please support the increase in funding. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Kevin O'Donnell. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chairman and members of the council. I've had the pr privilege of serving the Cuyahoga County in various uh, capacities from in 74 to 76, I was a member of the County Board of Mental Retardation, chaired it in 76. I served on the Regional Council on Alcoholism from 77 to 83. I was the first chair of the Alcohol and Drug Addiction Services Board of Cuyahoga County from 90 to 92, and I've been foreman of the uh, grand jury. My grand jury experience confirmed what my previous work in the field of addiction had taught me, namely, 75 to 85 percent of the cases we heard were resulting from the reuse of mind-altering drugs. Whether the specific charge was spouse abuse, robbery, or other crimes, the cause was addiction or mental health. My business experience here in Cleveland as CEO of CIFCO Industries showed me that we were smart to invest in an employee's assistance program to help our addicted workers attain sobriety, or beat their drug habits. It was simple mathematics. A using employee costs the company considerably more than a clean one. Absenteeism and poor work quality 
uh, were cost. However, the main cost to us was in our health care because through the use of alcohol, these addicted workers and drugs suffered from chronic ill health and required more health care services. Helping people recover isn't just about money. When a person who has been beat to the ground by drinking and using, their families and friends also suffer. They too pay a price in emotional terms. They, they suffer hurt, disappointed, and must carry heavier family roles to offset the absence of their loved one. When a person gains sobriety, the family and friends also have a burden lifted from them. Generally, but not always, Families are reunited, and hopefully their mutual love is strengthened by what they'd suffered together. In closing, I am realistic to the uh, current financial conditions here in our country, the state of Ohio, and our nation. These are the toughest times I've ever seen in my 86 years, and I've been, I lived through the Great Depression. However, if the Adams Board isn't funded sufficiently, we're going to create an increase in uh, need for funds for subsequent services, and those services are uh, the cost of incar incarcerating these people, uh, services of, of providing housing, medical attention, and the like, all of which will greatly exceed the cost of trying to rehabilitate them, our fellow neighbors, our fellow citizens, and even our family members. In short, treatment works, people recover. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And next we have Catherine Kazal, Eden Incorporated. Ms. Kazal, welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman Miller and council members for the opportunity to speak today. In late 1990, the then County Mental Health Board approved a resolution to launch a new housing resource and development agency, which was Eden. The focus was to be all about housing for persons with mental illness. Access to affordable and decent housing for this population was extremely limited and many lived in substandard conditions and in shelters or on the streets. This commitment on the part of the Adams Board to fund Eden to address this challenging situation has remained strong over the last 20 years and has resulted in the development of over 3,500 housing opportunities for persons with disabilities. The Adams Board directly supports 300 of those housing opportunities. The current Adams Board has prioritized housing for the severely mental Ill, mentally ill as a high priority for funding with non-Medicaid service dollars. Despite this fact, over the last five years, funding has been reduced significantly, not a fact that you're not aware of, uh, due to cuts at both the state and the county levels. Eden alone has received over $350,000 in cuts to operating support and maintenance of these housing units over the period. Many have testified today and other, uh, at other points in time about the devastating cuts to the Adams Board over the same time frame. Eden has partnered with numerous organizations and city and county departments in order to maximize the available federal dollars for housing. We, along with these partners, have attracted over $70 million in capital funds for the construction of new permanent supported housing for persons with disabilities who are chronically homeless. Over 85% of these individuals in these units are persons with mental illness and or drug and alcohol issues. But these persons need supportive services in order to succeed in their recovery. It is the lack of operating and service funding that has stifled our ability to maintain our existing housing stock at the appropriate levels and to develop new units to meet the needs. Eden has current, a current waiting list as of this morning of 1,289 persons or households for the 300 units of scattered site permanent housing funded directly by the Adams Board. There are also 987 persons or households on the waiting list for the rental subsidy program funded by the board. These numbers we believe are an underrepresentation of the need, but are nevertheless staggering. With the current conditions in the housing industry, we have seen a significant decrease in the number of affordable housing units in our community. 
As a result, we expect to see a continuing climb in the number of people in need and a rise in the numbers of mental health consumers on our waiting list and who may end up in the, in the emergency shelters. Access to and the availability of safe, decent, affordable housing is, I think we would all agree, paramount to living a quality life and a humane response to persons living with extraordinary challenges. But it is also good public policy. Statistics have shown that when people are stably housed, they are more successful in their recovery. We have also shown that persons in need in housing use public resources such as emergency room services, psychiatric hospitals, and time spent in shelters far less when they are, than when they are not housed in our units. An example that is easily measured is the use of inpatient hospital days. The current cost of the state hospital for one day stay is approximately $550 or $16,000 a month. The cost of providing operating support for Eden Housing is $500 per month or $6,000 per year. The Adams Board budget has been devastated by significant cuts and the minimal safety net that has, has become so thin that it is hardly visible at this point. I implore you to please consider an increase to the Adam Board County allocation, enabling them to restore services to a more humane and cost-effective level. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Deborah Rex. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Thank you and, and good afternoon. I'm Deborah Rex. I am here as the chairperson of the Mental Health Advocacy Coalition, the MAC, and I'm also the CEO of Beachbrook. I want to take just a few minutes to share with you some numbers that others have been saying, but I think they're very important to you as members of the council. First, one in four, or 25 percent, of individuals have a mental illness. That's approximately 320,000 Cuyahoga County residents. Second, 7% of individuals have a substance abuse or abuse or, or substance dependence or abuse disorder. That is approximately 89,000 Cuyahoga County residents. Behavioral health disorders do not discriminate based on socioeconomic status, race, gender, or age. The contract agencies of the Adams Board served over 49,000 individuals in 2010, 49,000. Of those, 60% lived in Cleveland and 36% lived in the suburbs, with 4% having residents that was unknown. The map being provided to you includes the number and percentage of individuals in each district served by the Adams Board contract agencies. As you will see, there are Adams Board consumers in each and every district in Cuyahoga County. The Adams Board contract agencies have offices not only in the city of Cleveland but in suburban communities as well. But not everybody who needs services is receiving them. We know from the Center for Community Solutions needs assessment that over 27,000 individuals with moderate to severe mental illnesses and over 19,000 with substance dependence or abuse disorders who live under 200 percent of poverty, just those under 200 percent of poverty, live in Cuyahoga County do not receive the services in the community behavioral health system. As shown in the Adams Board report, a portion of this unmet need is in our suburban areas. And while the report focused only on the unmet need for residents under 200 percent of the poverty line, we know that there is unmet need in all of our communities. Additional investment in the Adams Board will mean additional investment in behavioral health treatment and support services in all of our communities. I stand before you today not only as the CEO of an Adams Board contract agency, but as the chair of the MAC, which looks at a broader community impact of mental illness. And the members that we have who are the courts, the schools, the faith-based organizations, community nonprofits, hospitals, and others who are represented by the MAC know that the historic underfunding of mental health services has had devastating effects on our communities. Untreated behavioral health issues create many problems in our communities. 
So I thank you very much for hearing me today, and I thank you for considering Mr. Denahan's uh, additional request for dollars to serve these folks. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The next one is David, and I need a little help on the name. It's, it looks like it starts with a G. Uh, Gretic. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Cleveland Department of Public Health, welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the Cuyahoga County Council. I'm David Gretick from the Cleveland Department of Public Health. Um, I'm the program director of a substance abuse treatment program called Centerpoint and also a substance abuse prevention program that was called Prevention Services. A, a lot of people raise their eyebrows when I say that the city uh, uh, of Cleveland Department of Public Health has an office in mental health and substance abuse, but I'm here to tell you that we do. And um, although both programs were significantly impacted by the budget cuts, uh, today I'm going to be focusing attention on uh, the former prevention services program. I say former as prevention services was a casualty of the recent budget cuts. Um, being supported in entirety by the Adams Board, our funds were cut not completely, but to the extent that we could not continue. I'm not frustrated with the Adams Board, which had to work with what it was given, but I'm disheartened because uh, this community has lost capacity in the form of skilled providers of an established uh, and proven process, which is essential in interdicting substance use. Um, crime, healthcare, utilization, and the workforce all experience huge financial consequences related to substance abuse, not to mention the uh, physical and social effects. It's been shown that uh, treatment has a benefit to cost ratio of seven to one, and the cost uh, to benefit ratio of prevention services is significantly higher. Would it surprise you if I said 15 to one? My program operated at $90,000. Uh, the effects of reduction to the overall array and capacity of prevention services within the county may not be apparent immediately, uh, but in perhaps as little as five years, one might look back to this time as being a significant moment in moving the bar, as it were, into another direction. Um, substance abuse prevention activities receive relatively little notice in the community outside of those organizations which actively employ the tenants or engage organizations which do. Um, but the scope of prevention is significant. It's multifaceted. It's a multi-community process. There's in individual interventions. There are organizational interventions which support uh, communities um, in, the, in the immediate environment uh, as in neighborhoods and in the broader sense of the county in general. Um, they're administered by certified professionals. Uh, um, many people aren't aware that these are credentialed positions. Uh, in my particular program, uh, the supervisor had a BA in psychology and anthropology, a minor in gerontology, a master's of public administration, an MA in counseling, is a professional counselor, a uh, Troy Mart Fellow, and a published author. Um, now, this isn't a field uh, known for extravagant salaries, but um, this is, is uh, not just indicative of personnel in my program, but across the prevention providership in the county. Um, I've, I've got a list of programs that I could read from which were directly affected by the uh, prevention services program. I will uh, create a, a written document to send to you that notes all of those, but in conclusion, I heartily urge you to consider supporting the Adams Board in restoring and perhaps augmenting uh, their capacity to support not only prevention programs, but uh, all the providers of behavioral health community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Kathleen Stahl of Stahl & Associates. Please come forward. Ms. Stahl, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Kathleen Stoll. I'm a licensed independent social worker with a master's degree in business, and I'm a resident of Beechwood, Ohio. I have been active in the field of behavioral health for 50 years, both in direct service and planning. I have no current agency affiliation, but I'm a member of the advisory committee of the Department of Psychiatry. I'm a member of the Behavioral Health Investment Committee of United Way, and I've been active on two of your transition committees, uh, Human Services and Economic Development. I'm now writing a history about mental health in this area, 
uh, talking about the closing of Cleveland State Hospital in 1975 after 120 years, the beginning of the Community Mental Health Board in 1968, and Hannah Pavilion at University Hospitals built in 1956 as the first psychiatric hospital as part of a general hospital in this area. I'm well aware of several problems that we face. The, the remaining public beds, there are no state hospitals now in Cuyahoga County, there used to be three. There are no beds in this county. Um, there are only a thousand beds to serve the entire population of the state of Ohio. The number of private beds in that same period of time has gone back to where it was in 1967. We've heard some of the previous uh, testimony about the lack of access to outpatient services. These services have been consolidated and distributed from what we started with, which was five community mental health centers with limited geographic focus, to larger mental health organizations like Murtis Taylor and Bridgeway, two of the original mental health centers, Connections at the Center for Families and Children, and Far West. We have seen a reduction in emergency services, which are provided by Mental Health Services and St. Vincent Charity. That is one of only two psychiatric emergency rooms in the entire state. So there's been a great disinvestment in mental health. I want to recognize the good work done by the Animus Board and staff in preparing a strategic plan for the board that helped the board evaluate the efficiency of the services that they were using and the need for additional services. And n now they are in a position with this sudden change in state funds and uh, the limited local funds, they're in the best position to make use of that study. I want to focus, however, given on my history, on the need for housing support, vocational and social rehabilitation programs in all the agencies to reduce the demand for acute services. So I want to emphasize that there were studies done over a period of 17 years that demonstrated that patients did well if they were involved in social and vocational rehabilitation services. Most of them will take their psychiatric treatment and their case management, but if there's nothing more, and particularly if they are both substance abusing and mentally ill, they do end up being at risk for hospitalization, and that causes then the problems that we have in acute care. I have submitted my testimony in written form. It's a little longer than I just gave it to you, but uh, I think you will find it of interest, and it certainly supports some of the things that have already been said here on the part of Eden and the Club on Magnolia. Thank you very much for your testimony. We uh, recognize the presence of Council President Connolly to the, to the committee. And the next person to uh, testify is Denise Ayers from the Far West Center. Please come forward. Ms. Harris, welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. I am here representing the Far West Center, a community mental health center serving western communities of Cuyahoga County, an area hard hit by unemployment, foreclosures, and a major increase in the use of human services. I am also representing the staff of the Compeer program that provides peer support services to support consumers in their recovery process. Our agency fully supports the Adams Board's request for additional funding. Our center and our Compure program cannot withstand additional cuts. We have already suffered cuts totaling nearly 35% in the last two years alone, when our need in our area has become greater. We currently have 83 consumers on the waiting list to get into the Compure program alone and we cannot end this program. We offer peer support and social network support, and our main goal is to save lives. All of us here know that without personal encouragement and without supportive network of people that care about us, 
and those with mental illness that the isolation and depression that accompany mental illness too often result in death by suicide. In our Compure membership of consumers, we have many suicide survivors. Compure offered these individuals a direction to follow when they were very lost. It offered them opportunities to meet others and form bonding, supportive friendships. It offered meaningful goal-oriented activities that they could look forward to. Our peer support services serve to, to give these individuals back their own voices and encourages them to speak about their needs and their goals. Funding cuts limit our center's ability to provide clinical services, and so services like Compure are needed more than ever. Our clients call themselves the poorest of the poor. Peer support services and mental health services work together hand in glove. Our services do pick up the real need that is there during treatment. Peer support services are entirely funded by local dollars. And they are the necessary step between stabilization and staying out of the hospital, staying out of jail, being able to return to a meaningful life, and even to return to employment. If mental health and peer support services are not funded, this safety net will be gone, and people will either return to the hospital, remain stigmatized and isolated, or worse, with no support, no treatment, no medication, and no encouragement or direction, some people will commit suicide. One suicide is too many if our county system's sole purpose is to help those with mental illness win back their lives. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And next we have Jody Bell, also representing Compere at Far West Center. Good afternoon, members of the council and the committee. My name is Jody Bell. I am a mental health survivor in recovery. And first, I want to say thank you for having an enduring and long track record as a supportive stakeholder in my personal recovery. I didn't have any numbers, and I don't have any statistics. I am living proof that your position as a significant fund stakeholder, it doesn't just stop here. However, I see you as that mother ego who, when it's time for her young to fly, she nudges that baby out of the nest. However, with a discerning eye, it swoops down in a flash to catch that young before it crashes, only to nudge it out again and again until it flies or dies. So my request today is swoop down with that discerning eye to see that the mental health service providers, peer support services, consumer operated services need that developmental time to reconstruct the way we do business today. My peers and I pledge you to allow us to learn how to fly, not just for a season or for a moment, but to fly season after season. Thank you for your continued funding support and consideration for future dollars. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next we have Mike Maloney, is that correct? Or is it Mahoney? Matoni, okay. I apologize. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. <clears throat> There are more deaths due to accidental drug and alcohol overdoses in the state of Ohio than deaths due to car crashes every year since 2007. Over 25% of all alcohol consumed in the state of Ohio is consumed by underage drinkers. Good afternoon, and I appreciate this opportunity to address all of you. My name is Mike Matoni. I'm the CEO of New Directions, an adolescent drug and alcohol and mental health treatment center in Cuyahoga County. We are a contract agency of the Adams Board, and we've provided services for the past 30 years to adolescents and families. Adolescents who use drugs and alcohol are one of our most vulnerable citizens. 
We provide services to over 700 young people and families per year. Our average family income is, is $18,000 a year. I've spoken to Councilperson Sonny Simon and Jack Schron in the past about our situation and our need for additional funding. Research has so shown that for every dollar invested in drug and alcohol treatment, it yields a return of seven to eleven dollars. How is that so? Less arrests, less incarcerations, less use of juvenile court, less likelihood of entering the adult justice system, more graduation from high school, less visits to urgent care and emergency rooms, and less family conflict. We are the only treatment center in Northeast Ohio that accepts young women, adolescents, who are pregnant. Our ability to provide these services is now being threatened by the underfunding at the state and both the county level. We are requesting that you fund the budget put forth by Chief Executive Officer Bill Denahan of the Adams Board. Our clients are counting on you. Here are some of our client demographics of whom you are helping. Our average client is 16 years old, has been using marijuana, alcohol, and now heroin for the last three years. They're at least one and a half years behind in school. 80% of them have juvenile court charges or involved in the juvenile court. 60% have active drug and alcohol use in their homes. Over 50% have a co-occurring mental health diagnosis. And believe it or not, over 70% of our clients have experienced some kind of trauma in the form of rape, incest, physical emotional abuse, domestic violence, and even human trafficking. Some of these lives are now in your hands for the coming year. For without the funding requests that the Adams Board is recommending or seeking from you, our funding, we will run out of funding early in 2012. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. And next we have Jody Morgan representing the Adams Board. Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, Chairman and members of the Council. Good morning. My name is, well, good afternoon. My name is Jody Morgan, and I'm the President of the Action Committee Advocating for Change that is supported by the Adams Board of Cuyahoga County. At this time, I would like to recognize other consumers that have joined me today to please request an increase in funding for alcohol, drug, and mental health services. My story is short, but it's not simple. I'm 33, a longtime resident of Strongsville, a mom, and I was diagnosed as bipolar in 2005. In 2004, my life was turned upside down. I was spending money out of control to the point where I was using my company credit card improperly, not paying bills, not caring for myself or my daughter. Once I was caught, I did go to jail, where I received zero mental health treatment. And once I was released, I didn't know what to do or where to go. My family was ripped apart because of what happened, and they were as clueless as I was as to what to do to help me. I had no food, no medication, no shelter, no money. It caused me to turn to alcohol, and that ended me up in a homeless shelter as well as various psych wards. It took me hitting rock bottom to go and receive a variety of services that the Adams Board had provided to get me back on track. I used employment and training services, counseling, support groups, psychiatry, and other support services that the Adams Board and its um, other um, venues have to offer. Without these services, I do not know where I would be. The Adams Board has helped me become a good mom, a productive member of society, and has given me the ability to get on track and stay on track. Please consider this increase so that individuals such as myself and the others here, and even those that are absent, can continue to be served by the wonderful services that the Adams Board provides, such as housing, medical, employment and trading, medication, counseling, and so much more as you have heard from me and others today. Without these services, uh, these individuals and others would possibly go untreated and end up in the streets, in prisons, hospitals, or even worse. Please increase our funding to help these people to continue a stable life and help me to be a stable person, a mom, a daughter, a sister, and a friend, and to give back to the groups and organizations that have helped me to get where I'm at today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next, we have Jessica Weymouth. Welcome to the committee. 
Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Weymouth, and I'm a staff attorney with the Cleveland Housing Court on behalf of Judge Raymond L. Pianca. I'm here today to address the importance of mental health services to our court, the community, and the valuable work of the Adams Board. The Housing Court typically hears about 20,000 cases per year, 8,000 of those criminal building and housing code cases, and 12,000 civil cases, including evictions, nuisance abatement, and receivership. The court encounters individuals struggling with mental issues in three main areas. First, the court frequently handles evictions where defendants are um, facing eviction due to, housekeep due to housekeeping issues or disputes with neighbors due to untreated um, mental illnesses. Mental health services are essential to decrease these types of ev evictions against indiv individuals who are simply struggling and but for an untreated mental illness would be able to maintain housing for themselves and their families. The second area is with respect to the court ordered move outs. Um, the court typically is able to make referrals to the city of Cleveland's Department of Aging. Um, they accept referrals for homelessness prevention for defendants that are 60 and over and also 50 and older receiving some sort of um, social security benefits or other benefits. However, a gap exists for individuals who are mentally ill and do not fit that criteria. Additionally, our bailiffs from the housing court go out to conduct move out, move outs daily, and they are they sometimes are met with um, defendants who are struggling with a mental health crisis. This year, they were able to um, refer people to an agency that helped the individual become go through the probate process and admitted it into a behavioral health facility. Otherwise, they might be homeless. The agency, supported by the Adams Board, helped provide emergency support to litigants, and without this support, many of the defendants would end up on the streets. The third area is with respect to hoarders. The court frequently handles cases where the defendant is facing criminal and or civil liability due to hoarding, which causes health and safety concerns to the defendant and the surrounding neighborhood. This past year, we handled a case where due to a traumatic experience, the defendant began hoarding. He was unemployed, uninsured, and found the process of negotiating the mental health system difficult and was met with um, difficulty in trying to obtain those services. He wanted to obtain those services so his young daughter would be allowed to, to visit his home in a, in a safe and sanitary home. In conclusion, many of our lit litigants are in low income, uninsured individuals who without the support of community-based services struggle with housing issues like eviction or hoarding. The court has noticed an increase in the need uh, for services funded by the Adams Board, but due to, the, due to the economy. However, without additional funding on a county level, those needs simply won't be met. The Adams Board provides behavioral health services in our county that assist the work the court does. And I want to thank you for taking the time to consider the housing court's comments. Thank you very much for your testimony. We appreciate uh, everybody's comments this afternoon, and, and there, uh, there would have been more, except that uh, the Adams Board uh, worked to send a representative group to uh, present instead of everybody. Uh, but to uh, conclude, on behalf of the Adams Board is its director, Mr. Bill Danahan. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Miller, to the members of the county uh, council. Um, I can't say with any more elegance uh, and accuracy uh, what you've heard today already. Um, I do want to recognize some people that are in the audience that uh, are here in support and that have provided uh, written testimony. And if they could stand when I call them, I would appreciate that. Dr. Lisa Thomas, who was a Care Alliance and actually set up the first uh, housing organization uh, uh, several years ago. Greg Ulan, the president and operating officer for Orca House. Myra Korn Lipinski, PEP Connections. Sister Joan Gallagher was St. Augustine's and the founder of Joseph's Home. John Lizzie, who uh, is the CEO of the Shaker Heights Youth Council. Mike Baskins, I think, was here from Nami Greater Cleveland. Mario Tanti was here from Beachbrook. Bo Hill from Harbor Light. Eugene Cash uh, with the Cleveland Metropolitan School District and also on our board. Maureen D., who represents Catholic Charities. 
those that were going to come at a different time today, Dr. Bob Ronis, United, uh, excuse me, University Hospital Chief of Psychiatry, uh, Chief Michael McGrath, the Chief of Police for Cleveland, uh, CEO Eric Gordon from the Cleveland School System, uh, St. Luke's Foundation, Denise Zeman, and Stan Miller from the Marcus Grovey Academy. We all stand here and ask you to review and take a serious look at the budget. I need to tell you that mental health and alcohol and drug in this community is in the most serious crisis. Our intakes are closed. The waiting lists are far longer than anybody would exist. We are not providing the services that this uh, community needs and deserves. Those that have testified uh, have represent the widest base of this community. This is our community. I ask you to reconsider and provide greater funding for the Adam Board while we deal with the crisis at hand. Thank you very much for taking your time and your patience to listen to all of the testimony. Thank you very much. It's my understanding that there are a couple that uh, wish to testify and for some reason I don't have, have sheets here so uh, anybody else wish, wishing to testify I would ask that you uh, please come forward and then after you leave if you could fill out one of these forms so that we have a record of your presence. Uh, please introduce yourself by name and you may proceed. Thank you, and thank you for your patience in extending this process a bit longer. Um, my name is Allison Rand, and I'm a program officer with the Woodruff Foundation, which is a private grant-making foundation that makes about $500,000 in grants annually, exclusively to fund services related to mental health and addictions in Cuyahoga County. I've been doing this work for about seven years, and I feel like it's given me some special insights into the state of the behavioral health system in our community. And so I am here to lend my support to the Adams Board request for additional funding. First, I see that as important as private philanthropy is to Cleveland, it really only constitutes a small portion of our safety net funding. Data from the Center for Community Solutions shows that in Ohio, human services, the broad category of which most mental health services are a part, only 2% of funding comes from foundations. Almost all of the rest is absorbed by federal, state, local, and county funding. So you see um, that even though we're so fortunate to have such a robust philanthropic sector here in Cuyahoga County, the dollars simply aren't there to help service providers absorb the cuts in public funding. We recently brought together some focus groups of our past grantees to talk to us about the current environment that they're operating under. One of the questions that we asked was what role foundation funding plays in their organizations. And we heard over and over again that what they value about those dollars was that they let them try new things, improve upon service delivery or clinical approaches, or support the corollaries to, to treatment that public funders can't. Um, but that private grants cannot and do not make up a major portion of their operating revenues. This morning, um, I looked at the most recent audits for two of our community's largest behavioral health providers. In fact, just to check this, um, what I'd been hearing, and I saw that private funding, including foundation dollars, corporate and individual donations, <clears throat> and in one case, United Way, provided just 5 and 3% of their operating dollars. This leads me to conclude that shortfalls in public funding just cannot be absorbed by private philanthropy. Secondly, my work has made me develop real worries about the sustainability of a system that has responded to years of eroded funding by cutting, cutting, and cutting some more out of its administration and infrastructure in order to try to preserve the clinical services that we've heard so much about today. We review audited financial statements along with our grant proposals, and so we get a snapshot of grantees' fiscal health. The agencies whose primary business is behavioral health do not look good. Several run significant operating deficits year after year, have huge lines of credits and other liabilities, and virtually no cash reserves. It's possible that it's only through really extraordinary management that not all of the agencies are in fiscal crisis, and that the ones that are in crisis continue to be able to operate. 
But what's even more concerning is what the audits don't show, that when basic expenses exceed revenues, agencies defer important expenditures that ultimately impact their ability to do business. We see huge unmet capital needs, painstakingly limited investment in technology, curtailed staff development and training, and ultimately I believe that our community will pay the price for all of this deferred investment by being gradually less able to respond to the needs of our citizens. And with this perspective from organized philanthropy, I ask that you support mental health addiction services by increasing funding to the Adams Board. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. My name is Douglas Lenkowski. I am a psychiatrist. I practiced and taught at Anna Pavilion of University Hospitals from the time it was opened in 1956 until it was torn down a couple of years ago to make room for a parking lot, which was not my favorite decision of the administration. I also was, had the pleasure and uh, was a member of the first mental health board that was called the Cuyahoga County Mental Health and Retardation Board. Uh, and I was appointed after I had worked on House Bill 648, which created the boards in our state. I won't belabor uh, the need for the 25 million that has been described by both by Bill Denahan and other members of contract agencies. But I want to talk for a minute or two about the future and the fact that what we're going to have to do is respond to a challenge to integrate mental health and alcoholism services with primary care. It's, this is being seen as a major uh, problem in the country and it is anticipated very broadly that integration will be a major force in the development of health care reform in this country. In the, in the decades. Integration makes sense both from the provider and the consumer perspective. 68% of patients with, uh, with behavioral problems have associated medical problems with them. And correspondingly, 28, 29% of patients with medical illnesses have, uh, have behavioral disturbances associated with them. So that to provide comprehensive care, integration is going to be necessary and we'll need, probably need your help as we work on this in the future because it's going to be a problem. We, a lot of us have tried to keep it close uh, close to medicine in the past, but uh, other leaders in mental health have, have felt that we would fare better to emphasize the separateness of, uh, of behavioral services from the rest of medicine. That was a mistake as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we will be hearing more about health homes that, that have been written into the uh, <coughs> national legislation and we will need to, it's just, health homes to me are just a, another way of describing comprehensive care which is in the offing for all of us. I think I should stop, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there anybody else wishing to be heard? Please come forward. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andy Gonzalez. A special greetings to your honor. How are you? Um, I'm the chief of police for the Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority, CMHA. I've been so for the past four years. Prior to that, I was the commander of the city of Cleveland's third district neighborhood, uh, which encompassed the downtown neighborhood. And I'll keep this very short. Please support the Adams Board. Um, as a police officer over 30 years, we never get invited to the wedding. We always get invited to the divorce. Um, 
we've seen over 30 years the destruction that has created by the lack of treatment available. You probably have heard recently how we are experiencing right now roughly a 28 to 30 percent increase in violence among youths. I say to you that as a cop, I think that that's a direct result of a lack of services that has been deteriorating over the past several years. I really, really encourage this board, this council, to give Bill Denahan and his team what he needs to meet the services out there. And finally, you know, we frequently talk about how we can, in law enforcement, resolve these problems, these crime issues. I'm here to say we cannot arrest our way out of this problem, plain and simple. Jails are too full. People going to jail, they're coming back out, committing more crimes. I remember in 2005 where an individual who had drug, alcohol, mental health issues came out of prison, didn't know where to do, where to go. He spent the several days of the coldest days in 2005 right in public square. We didn't know he was there until the snow plow came by, was clearing the grounds, and unfortunately, the snow plow uncovered his body. Please, please support the Adams Board. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else? OK, thank you very much. The uh, one more? Do we have one more? We're good. OK, we're good. OK. The uh, next item on our agenda is to go on to departmental appeals. This is the time where uh, any department that has, uh, has requests that they want to bring forward if they're not uh, happy with the, uh, the budget as it stands with the amendments that we uh, uh, adopted on Monday, it provides the opportunity to uh, uh, come forward. Uh, we're going we're gonna to stand at ease for just a moment to allow anyone who, uh, who needs to leave at this point to do so. And then we're going to ask Judge Nancy first to come forward and present on behalf of the Court of Common Pleas. Uh, Okay, uh, judge first. Not here. Okay, well then, in that case, we will uh, move on to uh, Mike O'Malley with the prosecutor's office. And uh, I would ask those making uh, departmental presentations to uh, be concise and specific. But as soon as we'll, as soon as we'll go right after, she'll go right after the prosecutor. Uh, okay. To be concise and specific, but will not be under the uh, three minute limit. You can take what time you need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council, my name is Michael O'Malley. I'm the first assistant Cuyahoga County prosecutor. And I would just like to. Um, ask this body to reconsider. I assume, Councilman Miller, your amendment, is that the amendment that will be passed for the budget? To, uh, to explain the process, the, uh, the four-page copy of amendments, these were, the, these were adopted on Monday, which, uh, which produces the second version of the, uh, the budget, but, but we're not done. Uh, there, there will be... Uh, perhaps some amendments today, and, and I'm sure we will consider more amendments on the 28th, which is when we hope to pass this uh, 
legislation out of committee. So uh, the reason why we're having departmental appeals is for anyone who uh, who wants us to make uh, further changes to uh, to make that appeal at this time. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you know, the prosecutor's office made their presentation, and I'm not going to uh, drag on the issues, but certainly several issues that we had presented in our items that our decision items presented to this council including a salary salary parity with the other uh, uh, legal departments within the county as well as a critical need to replace our, our servers um, our computer system is the backbone of the prosecutor's office as you know many of you have toured the office many of you have seen our sauce software system um, we have open discovery now that is all conducted electronically um, these servers are critical to our operation and it's um, disheartening to see items that have been um, suggested for amendments and not see a critical item such as, as our server system or our computer system receive the capital upgrades that are necessary to maintain that system. Um, the product prosecutor's office has been and will continue to be um, a critical function of the county government. And while I understand that most of you are, are fairly new here, um, crime is not new in this in this county. And it's critical that our computer system operate. And we, again, really implore you to uh, look at that issue regarding the servers, as well as the salary parity. Um, a salary survey has been done for, or is being conducted currently as we speak for classified employees. I am certain that that will benefit our classified employees, most of whom make very meager dollars. Um, so we look forward to the results of that survey. But it is easy for us to look at what other attorneys in this county make. We had a salary survey done um, that was completed five years ago. The public defender has used that, has utilized that survey to bump their salaries up. Times were tough, and it, though the salary survey suggested that we start our prosecutors off at uh, 51,000, we have not been able to do that. So again, we currently roughly have 60 prosecutors who are not making the minimum that was suggested from the salary survey five years ago. We ask you to take that into consideration, as well as the issue with our civil staff. Um, when the county executive came into office, uh, prior to him coming into office last November, we implored him to respect the salary structure that had been um, outlined already in our office. We've got attorneys who've been here 10, 20 years. Dave Lambert's been head of that division for 10 years, and we, we implored the county executive and the chief of staff not to go down a path where it was going to create inequities between the soon-to-be law department and our civil staff. And apparently those, uh, that request was ignored and what we now have is inequity. And it is unfair to the people, and the, especially the people in our civil division, who've been carrying the water and the legal responsibilities of this county for years and years and years, um, to have a fraction of their duties removed from them and to be underpaid and to not be commiserate with the uh, salaries of the law department. And that's no disrespect to the individuals of the law department. God bless them, I'm sure they're worth every dollar they receive. But I can tell you the men and women who make up our civil, civil division um, are also um, equal to the challenge that they've been carrying for years and years and years. So again, on our uh, server issue, as well as the inequities in our salaries, I um, strongly encourage you to revisit that issue. Um, We've got many hardworking women and men in that office, and I think they deserve to be compensated as such. Thank you. Any questions for the assistant prosecutor? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I, thank you. Um, first, I want to commend the prosecutor's office for their strong ICAC department, the Internet Child Crime Division, which has been at the lead and um, at being a leader in that field in light of what's happening right now. But I just want to be clear, um, I don't know if, if counsel's clear, that for every, um, the past few years, that the budget that was requested of the prosecutor's office has come under um, the actual spending. So, so with that in mind, I understand that the prosecutor's office has had the funding um, and, and has had the ability to raise the salaries of the, the good attorneys that work there, especially Mr. Lambert. Um, so I just want to make sure I understand that, that the money's been there, but, but the separate, separate um, county prosecutor's office has chosen not to use that to increase salaries. Well, I, I think it's been important, and I, I don't want to speak for Bill Mason, but I think I can in this particular time. It's always been important for Bill to come in 
under budget. He doesn't like to, especially in the difficult times, there's been budget cuts throughout the counties for the past several years, but certainly the last thing he wanted to do was go over budget. Now, having said that, I'm certain at the end of the year, um, we will probably have a budget surplus. And if the direction we're getting is to increase salaries unilaterally, certainly we have the legal authority to do that. But I think uh, Chairman Miller hit it on the head when Bill first presented to this issue to council is that we come down to this room working as a team. I think we're all part of the same team trying to represent the citizens of Cuyahoga County to the best of our abilities. And while we may have what appears to be record surpluses in the general fund and record surpluses in health and human services, it's still important that we reach our hand out to this council and say there's an equity here. We're bringing this to your attention. Our effort is to work hand in hand. And um, that's what this effort's about. Mr. Chair, can I? I just need clarification. I, I'm not sure I understand, Mr. Chair, to Mr. O'Malley. Um, in 2011, for example, it looks like you're going to have your budget's over about $500,000, and in the past years it's been upward toward $800,000. And those monies could have been spent um, before this new government was in place to pay your people fairly and what they deserve. Is that true? Well, I, I think you, you hit it on the point. We have given money back. But also included in that budget is our grant funds, where, as you indicated, we have a tremendous ICAC unit. That ICAC unit was not in place six or seven years ago. That ICAC unit was established by Mr. Mason as a result of grant funds, and that obviously resulted in additional employees being hired underneath that grant. So um, while, yes, it does look like the, the budget has increased or, or, or is at least staying the same, the reality is grant funds help supplement a great deal of our budget, including the Mortgage Fraud Task Force, ICAC and other items. And um, you're right, we have given money back. Um, and Mr. Mason can unilaterally raise salaries, but our effort was to touch base with this body prior to doing so. Again, there's salary surveys being conducted for the classified employees. We think that'll be, bring some relief to our, our, our employees. Um, but the one that we had for the, the attorneys was done five years ago, obviously before there was a civil section. Um, but we're still being underpaid that. And I've got your direction, Councilwoman Simon. Um, you're saying if it's there, do it. Mr. Mason has that authority. Again, our effort was to try to bring it to this council and um, reach out hand to hand. Yeah, and, and I just want to be sure, thank you. So, so if Mr. Mason chooses to raise the salary of his lawyers, he can do so based upon the, the past, past budget. And the other question I have when we talk about parity, that issue has come up a lot in our hearings, um, Mr. Chair, to Mr. O'Malley. Um, th that, what, that what you're speaking of is that pursuant to the charter, the, we hired a law director. Is that what you mean by parity? That one attorney who's a director at, for the new government has brought up the issue of parity, so I'm clear. Well, certainly prior to the formation of the government, um, the charter had a law department. That law department was going to be taking a fraction of the responsibilities from the prosecutor's office. We've had prosecutors doing civil work in the office for years and years and years. As many of you know, Dave Lambert has been head of that section for years and years and years. And the point that was made um, over a year ago was that we've got civil staff who've been doing this job of which you will be taking a fraction of it come January. And be cognizant of the fact that those individuals who have remained hardworking, dedicated county employees um, have feelings and feel a sense of pride within the office. And it is very disheartening for them for that when people would be hired, that they would be hired at a salary, and with all due respect to the law department, I'm sure they're doing a fine job, but they would be hired in a salary that is greater than those people who've been here for five, 10, or 20 years. And it's just, it's common sense, really, is what it is. And I can't say it any easier than that. Um, we continue to do the vast majority of the work of the county with the same people we've been doing it with for years. And um, to not take that into consideration when you set your new salaries for the new law department would be ill-advised, and it was. M Mr. Chair, just one more question. I, when you say people, you, do you know that there was only one person hired in the law department and that the other lawyers were already working for the county and were absorbed? Or, do you know that? I know there was a law director hired. I know there was a assistant law director hired, so I know there's two at least. Okay. And the rest were absorbed? 
the rest so were, I just want to be clear. The rest, the, the rest were already there, here. So with, all due res, with all due respect to those individuals, I'm sure they're worth any, every penny. This isn't a personal issue. This is a fairness issue. I understand, but I want to be clear for those who are watching that this law department did not hire a whole host of individuals to work. S several, and several may have been given increases Two. upon arrival. So, so in, in my closing statement is I hope that with the budget that Mr. Um, Mason has been given for the past five years, 10 years, that he would use that to raise the salaries of the great lawyers that work there, including Dave Lambert. I think he does an exceptional job. So we can agree and on certainly that. no disrespect to your department at any time, but because the money's been there every year, I, I think it should be used for, for the lawyers. Duly noted. Uh, Councilman Jones and then Germana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In regards to the capital upgrades, has there been any, for the service, has there been any dialogue with our um, Jeff Maury? Our Certainly, I, I believe all IT purchases, including those servers, would go through the AD por ADP board and, and the usual um, IT purchases uh, path that everything goes through now in the county and has gone through in the county. So it's a part of the bigger, Correct. bigger picture? Thank you. Count, Councilman Duran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Jones actually uh, asked pretty much the same question because when uh, Mr. Mason was here, I thought uh, his, his appeal for IT was uh, increasing the staff of, of the IT um, people, no, not, no, the, not necessarily you know, the, the, the capital servers. Decision item number one included the civil staff inequities, bringing our um, IT staff up to the current ISC staff uh, salaries, as well as the third aspect of the first uh, decision item was, was for the criminal general, general felony unit who are currently being paid below the public defenders and below what the salary survey said they should have been paid five years ago. That was decision item number one. Decision item number five was, in fact, the servers. Um, th replacing three age servers as well as the batteries. I don't know if many of you have been up to the criminal courtrooms, but our IT, our, our general family unit, as much of our office will be soon, is all being conducting business on laptops. And if any of you ever had a laptop, as you realize, those batteries go after a while. And we have several hundred laptops that our uh, assistant prosecutors utilize. And the fifth decision item, including replacing the servers and replacing the batteries in those um, laptops that our APAs use on a daily basis. I would, I would just make a comment that, uh, that I agree with Ms. Simon that there may be some things that can be done within the existing budget, but that I also do appreciate the prosecutor's efforts to coordinate with the, uh, the council and in the, the administration on the salaries, and I think that uh, that's a good thing that should continue. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank okay. you, Council. Uh, okay. Next, we have uh, Judge Nancy first speaking on behalf of the uh, Court of Common Pleas. Chairman Miller and members of the uh, committee and the Council, thanks again for hearing me. Um, Number one, I am here on behalf of our uh, budget for the court. So I spoke earlier um, uh, as a public comment. Uh, number one, thank you uh, for the $200,000 allotment uh, against the levy dollars for residential treatment. That will allow us to effectively allocate the treatment to reduce recidivism, and uh, we do appreciate that. Um, when I looked over what uh, the recommendation was, and upon notice that no one read statement of the vacancy rates uh, was recommended, if you, I don't know if you have our, our paperwork there in front of you, I think I came with three prongs last time around, and the first was, uh, were uh, salary lines. So anyway, uh, upon notice, we went back to the drawing board to examine the impact on our court operation, and this examination and assessment was conducted in the context of the mandate of the recently enacted HB 86, the adoption and implementation of evidence-based practices, which is uh, right underway in our uh, probation department, and the increase that we've seen in psychiatric referrals. And you've heard a little bit about that earlier um, in this session. As a result of that, I am here to request reinstatement or the additional $291,429, and, and here's why. Uh, 
in explaining the mandates and the impact and required steps to comply with uh, HB 86, which became effective September 30th, there are changes and I'm going to enumerate those and I think also I'll submit something in writing so you'll be able to digest them uh, as you make your decision as well. First, the intervention in lieu has been expanded to include mental health and behavioral health, um, not just substance abuse. So that will increase our numbers as 20% of the population that we see coming through our court has mental health, behavioral health issues. So we will see an increased, uh, we will see a need in increased uh, clinical assessments from the court psychiatric clinic, increased eligibility determinations, record checks and supervision in the caseload of early intervention and intervention in lieu uh, in the pretrial and also in the pretrial uh, phase. One of the other changes in the uh, mandated by HB 86 was the felony fours and fives. There are certain felons that cannot be sent to prison. And we, uh, the Ohio Department of uh, Rehabilitation estimate, estimates that this will impact seven to eight percent of our current population. So based on the admissions in Cuyahoga County in 2010, we would see probably uh, about 350, 400 cases, which would have to be sentenced to community control instead of prison. That will require us to increase the number of risk assessments and pre-sentence uh, reports for these offenders, additional supervision in their caseload, and this would be probably, uh, if they were going to go to prison, uh, may require a little more in their case supervision. Uh, increased services, treatment services for substance abuse and behavioral health, increased urinalysis, increased uh, length of jail time while waiting for treatment placement where uh, applicable. So the third change is in judicial release, it increases the pool of eligible candidates who can be released back into the community uh, before completing their prison term. That will require us to um, uh, impact, it will have an impact on our supervision caseload that will increase. The, uh, we have to do an increased number of risk assessments again, um, and the demand for community resources is going to be up as well. But again, risk assessment, supervision, caseload increases as a result of that change. Non-support, there was a change in HB 86. That is a, will have a small impact, but will have some impact. These are offenders uh, for felony non-support charges. Some of them were sent to prison. Some went to prison after violations of their community control. We, we, have a, we will have more offenders to supervise under community control, and this is special programming. Uh, we, uh, we also have treatment costs, et cetera, and more supervision to make sure that these individuals are out working and paying their uh, back child support. And these are people who have lots of problems and the, the, the amounts that they owe are really kind of astronomical. Uh, I talked about evidence-based uh, practices. That has become part of the law as a result of HB 86. And um, where we see it is the risk assessment tool mandates that we use uh, this at the pre-sentence uh, stage for all moderate and high risk um, individuals. In other words, the evidence-based practices requires us to do more. There's more concentration, there's more time spent, not only at the beginning of the phase, because we, we use this risk tool when someone enters our system, but also at different phases, so there's more to do. Um, the training connected with that has been substantial, continues to be substantial, and must be in compliance with the state protocols and, um, um, and requirements. We lost um, state PSI writers were completely eliminated. We were able to absorb and hire back a few more, but we are still short 19 PSI uh, ORIS uh, writers the Ohio Risk Assessment uh, Officers, we are, uh, and, and they conduct these long interviews here to make sure that we know what the needs are gonna be for the moderate and high risk offenders. Uh, we also have this component in our risk assessment of quality assurance, so we have to report constantly back to the state and adhere, um, make sure that we ad ensure adherence to the evidence-based practice um, uh, principles to be able to maintain funding and um, 
and fidelity to the project, which ultimately means risk, risk you know, reduce risk recidivism. Probation law changes. Uh, there is a minimum, con as a result of that evidence-based practice change and mandate, we have minimum contact requirements, including face-to-face -face collateral and field contacts, graduated response to technical violations, accelerated timetables to address violations. We are not uh, permitted to have concurrent jurisdiction. In other words, you can't have someone who's on probation in one jurisdiction as well as ours. Uh, they must be combined. We have minimum training standards. Uh, the, the protocols and all the requirements of evidence-based practices must be adhered to. Uh, and we are also re uh, required to report to, to a statewide data repository the number assigned to probation, the number terminated, and the reasons for termination, et cetera, a great deal of detailed um, information. And we have to give them the total number of active uh, probationers at the end of our reporting periods. That's, that's something new that we need to do, and it is not an insubstantial uh, job. There's also an impact on this evidence-based adoption of this evidence-based mandate. The impact on the community-based correctional facility and the halfway houses, people that we used to be able to put there, we would have low-risk offenders. We are no longer permitted to uh, put them there. So these moderate risk offenders can only be sentenced to those locations as a result of a violation. They will now require more supervision in the field and, and uh, behavioral health uh, issues addressed you know, in, um, um, under a, a regular or a high risk caseload. In other words, they won't be in the CBCF, they won't be in the halfway house, they'll be on the street. And I, I see, what I see is kind of a, um, as a result of this, a new development, perhaps a day reporting. I, have, I see the development of one more way for us to do probation, which is gonna take some resources as well. Um, one of the things that uh, does impact county jail, the fours and fives, by the way, that cannot be sentenced to prison, the law says that if you do, if you do not have a location to put these fours and fives, they stay in county jail for 45 days while the state of Ohio looks for an alternative placement for them. We are fortunate in Cuyahoga County, we have well-developed programs. However, we, you know, if we have to keep them there for 45 days, if we, if we can't offer enough of this array of alternatives, um, you know, uh, Sheriff Reed is going to have some uh, additional headaches. He's already dealing with a pretty substantial population. So based on that, I am back to ask for that one component, uh, $291,429, and I, I think that it is a reasonable and necessary request, um, and hope that you see the same. I am willing to take any questions if you have, and I have Greg Popovich here with me and uh, Jim Ginley uh, in support, uh, or here to answer any questions that you might have. Judge First, is that 291,000 figure, is that per year as opposed to the, uh, for the biennium? I believe that is for the year, however you're funding us, yes. So it's per year? I would, yes. Okay. Yes, I anticipate that. I think the way that uh, I saw the, the bill come in, yes. Questions by my colleagues? And I'll be happy to, uh, I have tons of information, I'll be happy to submit anything in writing that you wish to see. Uh, HB 86 is about 500 pages long. Congressman Gallagher. Mm -hmm. Hi, Judge. Yes. Um, unfortunately, you have to deal with Columbus with these new things. My concern is this, since you were last here, uh, we recently <laughs> discovered the problem in the collection of court costs in the clerk's office going back nine years mm -hmm. to the tune of north of $50 million. Were you aware of that? No, I was not. These are, see, the disturbing thing to me is, is these are your costs that the clerk's supposed to collect. They should be going back into the court, and here you are on bended knee asking for $290,000 a year, and I'm, I'm looking at maybe collectible $20 million. And it's disturbing to me that that had happened. Well, you have to remember that the court, our court does not. I know this isn't you, this is the clerk not collecting it. Yeah, but we don't, we are not the collect mechanism. We are the ordering mechanism. Right, mechanism. and your orders are not being, are, are not okay. being followed. 
and it disturbs me to no end that this practice has been going on. And I just wanted your comment yeah. on that. Because in my mind, this goes back into the court system. Yeah. These aren't general fund dollars, but no, it does. No, it, it does. They go. They do go back. Well, into they the would general affect fund. the general fund because that comes yeah. back to us once you're covered. Right. I don't know what to tell you except that our probation department is uh, what we have done in kind of jazzing things up in the last year to in shifting into this evidence-based practice because we're moving people physically around, finding new ways to to do things that we have. Uh, we have a person now dedicated to court costs for criminal cases. I don't know if you're talking about I'm court actually, costs for oh, total. civil, I'm, civil, civil cases. Civil criminal, is, yeah. it's north of 50. Mm -hmm. I'm even willing to write off the criminal. Mm -hmm. But, you know, eventually these people get out of prison, got to come back, and they're going to need something from the county saying that, you know, they're... they're mm -hmm. They're going to need something, so we, we have a right. way to get some cash out I, of them. I but suspect, the civil cases yeah. really disturb me. Well, the civil cases, what we would like to do, we would, we're in fact in the process of enacting a rule. In fact, it should, it was supposed to be on the agenda, a rule to increase the security for court costs, court cost filings, so that you don't have to bill somebody. You just send them a return check so that we will cover. That is a pending immediately in our court. In fact, it should go out for public comment here uh, by the end of December. So uh, I think that that, in a large part, will help alleviate that problem. In other words, there's, there should be enough to cover the cost of a particular case well, it's just, so, it's, that, it's so that the clerk would only worry about sending refunds instead of chasing and collection. It's, so, it's a lot of money out yeah. there. And it's, uh, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't we, doubt we're, it. We're trying to work yeah. with the clerk and certainly we'll work mm -hmm. with yeah. Court, I just. Uh, I think on the, if I might answer your, address your question also on many times on the, you know, our indigent population is huge. Uh, many times uh, there'll be court costs that are um, forgiven in lieu of community work service or just will be later once somebody's put on probation. They may be originally ordered, but then later suspended if somebody has makes, makes a showing that they just can't pay that. So that often happens too, and I think that maybe some part of what might be on the criminal's outstanding um, bottom line well, I'm, might I'm be affected. I'm going to write that off. I'm yeah. going to write that yeah. off, but I mean on the civil but side. But on the civil side, yes, I, I can only offer what we are planning to do as right. uh, some, some way to ameliorate that problem. I could see it as a problem, but I don't, we don't have the collection ability. We can oh, no, only, I know, I know you know, that. we can only know uh, order. Yeah. I wonder if we get to the point where you just like community courts don't let them out of the building until they pay. Well, in the civil, yeah, good <laughs> and they luck. Do that. In the civil area, yeah, they kind of. Uh, but I think in the civil area, this this legislation that, or this new rule that we want to impose um, should really go a long, long way to help that. And we're just we're going through the motions right now to do that. Thank you. Okay. Council President Connolly. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't want to belabor the point. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Judge, but I've been talking to Keith Hurley down the clerk's office, mm -hmm. and there, there's got to be some better processes. I mean, lawyers tell me that they come in, they file the final judgment, and everything's done, and then mm -hmm. two months later they get a bill. And mm -hmm. there's got to be a better, and, and Keith writes me back as well, you know, this is, yeah. there's got to be a better way. Um, it seems to me you shouldn't be able to get a certified copy of your divorce decree until all your fees are paid. And I'm like, Mike, mm -hmm. I'll write off the indigents, but we've got to work with the clerk to get some better processes mm -hmm. here. I know at probate, you, you put up a larger deposit, and then yes. if you run out of money, you know, if you file a motion, you've mm -hmm. got to pay $2.50 or, you know, whatever yeah, it is. Right. So we've got to work with the clerk to improve this system because um, th there's a lot of money out there. And we've already uh, been in contact with the Attorney General and... Um, we'll be able to take money out of people's um, income tax return mm -hmm. for any court costs they haven't paid. But right. th this is really a very, very serious problem that has not been addressed by right. the clerk. And well, it's, it's, I don't disagree. Uh, it's time. I just had one more thought. One of the other things that we're trying to do to collect on cost on some of the criminal cases is we, we have expanded the use of 10% uh, options on our bonds. And that is that portion of the bond, the 10% type of bond, you can come back and uh, deduct the cost of the case from indigent. 
But you don't get your bond back until your fees are paid. That's exactly. what we the court. Yeah. Um, but but mm -hmm. I, yeah, I've never been a 10% bond person because a lot of those people leave well, and they never come back. But. Well, the thing is, we do, to the extent we can use it, we're right. doing that. So right. um, yeah, so it's a, it's a little bit little bit of help but, there. But I think that, that just as in conclusion, that I'm going to be working very actively on this, on this project, and I, I'll get back in touch with you. And I thought that we'd possibly get someone from the Bar Association, the various sections mm -hmm. of domestic relations. And yeah. Court of Appeals is really bad in terms of, of outstanding, mm -hmm. that we can work with those lawyers and get the practical sides of that right. so that we can get some of this money collected. Well, we're going to, as I mentioned, we're going to send it out for public comment, that, and certainly the Cleveland Metro Bar uh, will have uh, plenty to, okay. you Thank know, you. to weigh in on. So, But if, in it, to the extent that I can help, I'm happy to do so. Please let me know. Great. Thanks again. I, I any, hope you will consider us. Any other, uh, we, we any run other pretty... questions? Uh, oh, yes. Councilman Rogers. <clears throat> um, thank you. Um, thank you, Judge, for being here. I, I was a little confused, and hopefully you can provide some clarity, but you made mention that as a result of um, HB 86, that felony fours and fives are no longer um, allowed to be sentenced there to jail. There are certain, under certain circumstances, you know, we used to have the discretion to send. They're now cutting into our discretion by saying you cannot send these fours and fives under certain circ and, and um, we figure, we estimate about three to 400 in our system would be affected by this. You cannot send them to prison automatically. In other words, that presumption of, if you practiced, uh, you may know about those presumptions that came along on Senate Bill 2, uh, they have now made that part of their law. So if you do want to send somebody, it's, they either have to be a violator of their probation before you can consider sending them, or if you are consider, considering sending them, you have to give the Ohio Department of uh, Rehabilitation and Correction some time, that 45 di uh, days for them to figure out where they want to place this person if you don't have your own placement. Right, so, so um, my real question was what happens you made mention that there's a 45 day. Um, they sit that, in jail. They, they sit, sit in jail, jail for an yeah. average of 45 days, awaiting a disposition yeah, of waiting, their. Waiting for the state of Ohio to tell you where they might go if you don't have a place to put them. Ah, okay. I, okay. Well, my real question is: um, one of your colleagues has been traveling the county, speaking about the early decision program and how. Um, I just had a meeting on that yesterday. Early what decision that, court. No, it's not early decision. It's uh, early disposition. Could, or, early disposition conferences. What what happened years ago? His, here, you need a historical piece. When cases were bound over to come into the common pleas court, there was a period of time there where they were waiting to go to the grand jury, where they just be out there, and many times those defendants would be in county jail waiting to go to the grand jury. Right. In an attempt to get uh, there was a, and also a justice, was a justice management JMI report done years and years ago. And what they suggested as, as a way to remedy that long stay in county jail pending your uh, charge, you know, they talked about 10% bonds, they talked about early assignment of counsel, capturing that period of time to reduce. Uh, and to the credit of the, to the, uh, the prosecutor started something, you know, we've had many iterations over time, but that has effectively been eliminated, that problem time from bind over or entry into our system till the charge has been accelerated immensely. Mm -hmm. It's gone from 60 days to something like 21 days right. now. So that's what the early disposition um, conferences were, were are kind of meant. Now what we've done is refined because there have been impacts in doing this, there have been impacts to the court, it's not you know, they, they talk about saving money. What has been saved is time in jail pending your, your formal charge. And also, they have increased the ability to be charged by information. The visits to the grand jury are reduced on those cases, which can be, and they're not all cases. What we, and our, we just looked at our latest figures and what we've decided is of the cases coming in, 30, maybe 30% 30 of them could go on an early track. In other words, we get that we get them in there, we advise the defendant of what um, what the process is, we assign an attorney, 
if there's a waiver of preliminary hearing, we then can say, oh, we'll sign a judge, and the case, I would like the case to go immediately up to the judge, mm -hmm. you know, in a matter of days, for the judge to do the early disposition conference, and then hopefully to arrive at a disposition, either a diversion, um, a termination if the case is to be returned to municipal court, or plea by information. We figure that of those 30%, maybe, say for instance you send 10 to the judge, four of those may resolve in that manner, the other six may still go to the grand jury. But it is a reduction of the grand jury resources, which, which is good for those cases which can be um, uh, disposed of in an early way. Well, I'm, I'm, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm imagining that's a significant saving to the sheriff's office for the as many cases that we can speed up if people. Well, are... it still depends on. The good thing is, is that we have an attorney up early and we've got the bond up early. Whether somebody can post a bond is, is another story. Um, we see, a, you know, an ebb and flow in the uh, amount of cases. You still have, you know, 60 percent or 70 percent. I'm sorry, 70 percent, 65, 70 percent are still going to the grand jury, which kind of indicates that they're more serious right. cases. Of the 30 percent that you say would could be go. Out, could go, about how many of that 30 percent actually go to the? Well, early? they're going. They yeah. are. Okay. Oh yeah, okay. yeah, they're going there now. And, uh, but they, I think what what um, we'd like to make a few more changes, and I think by shifting, so I don't have to add any more resources to the program by shifting the case from the 12th floor where they're arraigned up to the judge who to whom it's assigned, mm -hmm. that that judge will make sure everything happens. You know, get all the resources together and see if they can come to an early uh, disposition on it. Great, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilwoman Simon and then Germana. Thank you. Please focus narrowly on the budget. Time is precious. No, I wanted to talk about By the, the way, weather, that, Judge. That, if, no. yeah, so if I could. I've been trying to uh, work this early disposition program in a way that will not require any more resources. I don't have to come to you for a, more in the budget if I can do it uh, the way I've been thinking about doing it. So just want you to know that. All right. Thank you, um, Judge. So the PSI reports, do I understand yes. that previously the state provided two people to write the reports? The previous, we used to do, uh, we hit, 20, they, used to provide over they had a, they had 28 people. They had 20. We we kind of had a hybrid. We had our own pre-sentence re, re, report writers, and then we had a portion because of the size of our court. We had a portion uh, of state reporters, parole. You know, the APA would write them. They did awake. They fired everybody. There are no PSI writers for the state of Ohio anymore. Uh, so what we were able to do is we've got a few back, but at the same time that that cut happened, we tried to make an adjustment in our product. But at the same time, on the other side is coming the evidence-based practice, which requires a lot more work at this front end now. And uh, not only does it come when they enter for the pretrial services and the bond, but once they plea, planning, supervision, I mean, it's much more involved. And what they've, what they've decided is they want to pour more resources in to make sure that defendants don't recidivate. They get these PSI writers with a lot more information than we ever had, not only about their static score, their, their history of criminal convictions, if they have any, you know, and, and their likelihood of reoffending, but also a dynamic case plan, which means they sit down and they, they really work with the defendant now to, uh, to formulate a plan that will work considering what the defendants and more input from the defendant. They take a long time, they're very intent, you know, they're very um, uh, individually intensive and um, informative. But I think, um, and it's been a very, it's a long, it's a long process, but they are doing a marvelous job. They're ahead of everyone in the state of Ohio, but they still have a long way to go because of our size. And we need resources, because it's saying what this, what this HB 86 is, says you use that risk assessment score, you keep your folks back local, we don't want them in prison, you use every option that you can locally, um, and that whole array, you know, make, we wanna make sure that that whole array is possible. I think there's a lot of value to it. So Judge, um, through the Chair, what, 
what happens if you have a backlog of um, it, cases? I mean, it, it's, does it delay sentencing? How does that yes, impact? Yes, it will right. delay sentencing. And if somebody's in uh, jail, although they, we try to keep uh, the precedence of those in jail, we try to have them looked at first to, to move them through. Yes, it will cause delays. And um, is the 290 request would help the resources for the for that particular yes, the aspect two, of the 290. What what I ask for here is the 290, and it kind of it kind of incorporates everything that I was talking about. It's um, the evidence-based practice implementation. We don't the the state or the experts are telling us we should have somebody who should be overseeing this. We don't have that point person there to to make sure all the parts are working, but somehow we're making it happen. Uh, the training is ongoing and very involved, and not only will it include our, our probation department and our, uh, uh, but our pretrial services, and also we want to incorporate our bond people in that too. They need the training as well. Uh, we, the tra we need uh, to consider a training coordinator for staff development and new mandated training. Um, the research component, the collection of data, is immense and it's something that we never had to do before. The state of Ohio could never figure out how many people they had on probation. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the data that they're correct collecting. And then using this new evidence-based practice, they wanna see is the risk, uh, is the recidivism down? Are these things working? And that's, that's gonna be a long haul approach. Um, Pre-trial officers, supervision officers, writers, the uh, PSI, what we call the Ohio Risk Assessment writers. Um, court psychiatric clinic, because of the intervention in lieu, those referrals are increasing. And as I may have mentioned, 20% of our population has this mental health, behavioral health uh, component. So we, are, we don't know exactly how many referrals we're gonna see, but we will see an increase. And the demand there is always high. Uh, we never seem to have enough. That's where the delays are costly in the psychiatric part of this, as, uh, as Sheriff Reed would tell you. Uh, okay. so, uh, there's more, but I mean, it, it includes all that, you know, the assessment, the, the supervision, um, the case plans, uh, everything like that. And I, I, um, I don't make the request lightly. I know that in, we, we, we really try to work as lean and mean as we can, but I don't want to short shrift the county because we've gone so far already. And we do have, um, um, uh, you know, we do have a really good probation department, psychiatric. I mean, they do a marvelous amount of work here and do a good job, so. Okay, uh, besides Councilman Germann, is there anyone else having questions for the judge? Okay, we're gonna, Hear from Councilman Germana, and then we're going to take a break. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to keep this brief, but from your testimony, it sounds like you know the state trying to save money on on, on prisons. They are, and then they indirectly are increasing all these costs on, on our court system. The evidence based, mm -hmm. uh, it's just kicking the budget and the problems down. Is is there any movement or any support throughout the the county courts in the state to to have them help correct uh, the, this burden that they've placed on the uh, local counties. Well, I think it's kind of an interesting. Maybe maybe there are too many laws. I don't know. Um, there seemed to be at a period of time prior to this big expansion of prisons. If you if you are asking my thought on it. Uh, Ohio had more people and fewer people in prison. Maybe it's the mental health component that they've abandoned on the civil side and now we're seeing it on the criminal side. Maybe it's substance abuse, um, you know, and all that goes with that. It's probably increased what we do. I, I look back to what, uh, I look back to my father uh, who sat on the bench for many years. He would be astounded at the type of work that we do now. I mean, these specialized courts, mental health, drug court, reentry court, et cetera, none of that existed when I began practicing law. So uh, it's interesting to see how we've kind of morphed more into a social end. But there is no doubt, and they have made no bones about it, uh, what the, the couple times that I've been to Columbus, they want us to take care of our own for a lot of reasons. And there are a lot of good reasons, but the burden is enormous on local governments. 
I don't, we're trying to, on those that have the lowest risk, we're trying to spend the least amount of resources so that we don't, um, we don't need to, to do much with them. But on that medium and higher risk, it's unavoidable and the mandates tell us what we need to do. So, does that answer your question? Yes, Judge, uh, you know, uh, it, you know what? it seems like what, what, what ticks me off is, uh, you know, they pay, pass laws to save money for the state. And, uh, you know, it would be nice if they could pass some laws that would save money for our courts, for some things that are outdated and modernized. Mm -hmm. And if you have any suggestions that right. we could I do. suggest to them, uh, not, not today. Yeah. <laughs> But, oh, thank but you. Really, I would be happy to return. <laughs> but, but really, they should be thinking about mm -hmm. how, how to save these courts out in the motherland. I won't, I won't belabor the point, but they, I believe they have been begun with this new HB 86. I think it has set up the possibility. What, one of the, as, a, as an administrative judge, I think what I would say overall, uh, regionalized mental health through the courts, regionalized probation. Now. You know, that's way easier said than done, but I think that's probably the way we should head. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Thank you Judge. very much. And uh, I feel bad that the sheriff's been sitting for two hours and uh, not catching bad guys, but uh, we're gonna, we gotta have a break. And uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna come back at, at 3.35 and then we have one more departmental appeal, which is the uh, film commission, and then the sheriff will be next. Uh, 335, on the dot. <laughs>